Good day, this is Jim Patel from Columbia Gorge Community College. This is Digital Electronics One. This lecture is entitled Expanded Inputs and Multi-Level Logic Circuits. Up to this point, we've got our learner's permit and we're driving around on two-lane country roads. And we're going to step it up a notch here, bring in some intersections, bring in some overpasses, and deal with some traffic. First off, what we're going to do is we're going to expand our inputs. We have mentioned previously that the AND gate has two inputs and the OR gate has two inputs. Expand those inputs. We're going to have three inputs, four inputs, so on and so forth. But before we do that, what I want to do is discuss kind of some three, in the series of this whole lecture, I'm going to, I'm going to discuss three basic properties of logic. And they're kind of no-duh things. I mean, you should be able to figure these things out. First one is a commutative property, which basically states a and b equal to x, it's equivalent. That triple equation means it's equivalent to b anded with a. The answer is no duh, of course it's equivalent, you know, because a and b, think of the expression a and b, it's obviously equivalent to b and a. I mean, just think about three times two sure is equivalent or equal to two times three. Same thing goes for the or gate, you know, a or b is equal to b or a. doesn't matter what order you put them in. Okay, we're going to be making use of that property quite a lot here, and that should be pretty easy to understand. Okay, so let's go ahead and actually talk about a three input AND gate. Okay, it's the same thing as our two input AND gate. The output is high when all inputs are high. And let's discuss the commutative property. Notice here, I've got it written CBA. I've got A, B, C written there. The truth table may appear in a different order, but the truth table for those results should still be the same. Okay, what is the output high when all inputs are high? Where in this truth table, and the, and the left one I'm referring to now, oops, let's do this one here. So we're talking about this one. Where in the truth table is all inputs high? The answer is right here. That is the one and only time C, B, and A are all high, all the rest of the combinations are zero. Due to the commutative properties, it doesn't matter. C, B, and A, or A, B, and C. Output is high when all inputs are high. Where's the one and only time? Right there, exact same spot. One, zero, 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 zero. Now to read these things, however, is slightly different. You may think that this zero, zero, one is equivalent to this zero, zero, one. It is not, it is not, it is not. What is it equivalent to? Think about this. That is C1, B0, A0. On this truth table, where does that appear? It occurs right here, C1, B0, A0. Because you flip-flop the order of these things, this entry here is equivalent to that. And due to the commutative property, yes, we get the same zero answer for all these things. What I'm saying is, is that these truth tables are equivalent. It's just that the addresses of them are different. And if you go through, find this one right here. And on this truth uh, on the left truth table, it's 0, 0, 1. On the right truth table, it's 1, 0, 0. Long story short, when I order a truth table, CBA, enter it as CBA. When I order a truth table, ABC, on a quiz or an exam, enter it as ABC. You'll just not get confused that way. Enough about the commutative. We don't really need to discuss that much more. But again, all we did was applied our previous definition. Output is high when all inputs are high. We did the truth table. Let's see if we can do a timing diagram. So what I've got is A in blue, B in red, and C in green. On this timing diagram, where would we expect our output to be high? For a triple input AND, the only time that I'm seeing is just right there and right there. Okay, so I would expect my output to look something like this. Okay, output is high when all inputs are high. In this particular case, it's all three inputs. One thing I want to discuss, and kind of for all these expanded inputs, I want to kind of do the same thing. I want to talk about the description of it, do a little bit of commutative properties, talk about the truth table, talk about the time and diagram. What's the next one? It's the logical expression. How do I write x? If I was to write this thing, it's a and b and c. So x is equal to a and it with b and it with c. And due to commutative property, I could do c B, A, I could do B, A, C. It doesn't matter as long as they're Boolean multiplied together. Speaking of Boolean multiplication, do I always need that dot notation? No. I can say A, B, C. Okay, now in VHDL, if I was to program this thing, if 
program a programmable logic device to become a triple input AND gate. I would say signal X is assigned the value A and B and C and close it up. Okay, let's take it up a notch here. Like I said, we're just going to expand our inputs. We're going to start doing some troubleshooting. Here I've got a known A. I know A. I know B. A and B. And I got my output X. And I know my output X. What I'm trying to do is find C. Okay, so here's our known output X. The problem is we don't know what the input C is. And this takes a little bit of step, step, uh, advanced step here is, is what could input C look like? There's going to be times that you're not going to be able to tell what it is, whether it's a zero or a one. There are other times you're going to definitively say it's a zero and definitively say it's a one. But those times when it's either a zero or it could be a one, that's what's known as a don't care. And believe it or not, it really is an accepted terminology. It's a don't care. Like some of you guys in electronics one, two, and three, you guys didn't care joking because you guys made it this far you obviously cared how is it don't care drawn i'll just describe it here i mean think about this right at this moment here what could c be well if a is zero and b is zero and x the output is zero c could be a one and it would also give us the x output zero it could also be a zero so what we often see is a don't care i think i've drawn these before it's kind of this hash marks in between. I don't care. I don't care what it is because I've got my result. My result is clearly a zero. Between, because say that was time zero to one, from one to two, what could C be? Well, C could be a one because it's one, zero, one, which gives us an output of a zero. It could also be a zero because zero, zero, one gives us an output of zero. So it's again, there's another don't care. Now, what happens when we get to time two to three? What is C definitely, what value is C definitely taking? Well, if A is one and B is one and our output is zero, very clearly C can only take the value zero because if it was a one, our output would also be a one. Does that make sense? You're just going back using that truth table and the description of a triple input and in reverse. Finally, from three to four, let's see what we get here. Well, A is a one. B is a one, and our output's a one. If our output is a one, all inputs must be high. C is very clearly a one right there. So let's go ahead and I'm gonna pause, or actually why don't you pause the recording? Go ahead and see what you think the rest of this timing diagram may look like. And I'm gonna go ahead and do my interpretation of it, and yours should closely match mine. And that's what my interpretation of this is. I've got a broad swath, I don't care. You've got a definite one there and a definite zero right there. Okay, so those are great exercises to see how well you really understand this. I think I've gotten everything uh, we've done here. Oh, troubleshooting. Let's say, for example, okay, our input C here, clean everything up. What would the input, excuse me, the output X look like if C was always a zero? Okay, let's say C is accidentally shorted to ground. What does C look like? Well, it's zero all the way across. What is the output look like and that's the thing is like you might think you have a signal on c but in reality you have a ground what would the output look like i mean think about the 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 expression x is equal to a and it would be and it with c and if c is always a zero a and b and zero think about three times two times zero what is it it's a zero it's always a zero so your output if you get a flat line zero chances are you've got something shorted to zero one of those inputs shorted to zero what would happen if c was shorted to one what would the output look like to build the ability to predict this is super 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 essential what would the output look like the output is high when all inputs are high if c is always high what we get is a region here where all inputs are high and another region right here where all inputs are high okay so your ability to read and troubleshoot to predict the behavior of things in erroneous circumstances super super key to your understanding this which leads to another point let's say i go to the and gate store and all i want is a two input and gate a and b x and guess what they don't have any of those they do have a bunch of these how do i make a two input and gate 
out of a three input AND gate? Well, it's exactly like what we just did. We shorted the output, excuse me, shorted the input C to one. What am I getting? Those times when A and B are high. It doesn't matter. C is taking no part in that for our output. Our output will be the exact same as if we had shorted that one previously, a troubleshooting, and now we're purposely shorting it to one. What is this making use of? It's making use of a property, which will, again, be going into some of these Boolean properties later. A and B and C is equal to X. If C is equal to one, what's A times B times one? It's A times B, i.e. A and B. Those unused inputs, you can't just leave them dangling there. You've already learned what an open looks like in a TTL circuit. It may be different in CMOS. It may be different for an FPGA or a CPLD. You can't just leave these inputs dangling there. You've got to do something with them. But now we did this whole thing with the three input AND gate. What we did is we did a description of it, talked about the commutative property, talked about the truth table, the timing diagram. We went over the logical expression for it to write it and to write it in VHDL. We talked about known inputs and an unknown input. We talked about some troubleshooting. We talked about what to do with unused inputs. Okay, what I'm challenging you to do, and this might make a good quiz or a test question, do the same thing for a four input AND gate. Same thing. Okay, just try to come up with it. Because what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna do a four input OR gate. So here's our four input OR gate. Let's go ahead and do the exact same thing we did, as we did with a three input AND gate. What is the description of an OR gate? The output is high when any input is high, when any input is high. Where is the one and only time where any input is not high? Okay, it's right here. That's kind of the unique. All the rest are just ones all the way down. So I'm using that same description we had before. We're just having multiple inputs now. What's the timing diagram look like this guy? Okay, so here's our four bit input, D, C, B and A taking the following pattern. What we're going to probably look like here is right about here. Sorry that it's not right on a block. Okay, basically this is the only zero. We've got a one right there. So just like we'd expect, any input is high, we get an output high. All right, what is the expression for this look like? Well, if a two input OR gate, and again, we're following commutative properties here, B, A, if the expression, let's say that's output X there, X is equal to A or B or B or A. We can write the expression the same way. It's X is equal to A or B or C or D or any combination of those four variables, D or A or B or C, because it's commuter. You can rearrange it however you see fit. The logical expression of VHDL, very similar to an AND, is X is assigned A or B or C or D. And this is something too that you may be already thinking about here. Is it, does it matter if I go one first or that's then do the other set? That's the associate property. We'll deal with it later. For this particular case, don't worry. It's all done simultaneously. So that's how you write it in VHDL. We did a timing diagram for it already. It was pretty simple. Let's do, um, let's do this guy right here. A, B, C, and D. Let's pretend we don't know input D. We've got a known output X. So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of D and give us a known X and see if we can go ahead and predict what D looks like. I've erased the previous D input and what I've done is put an entirely new X output here. Based upon your experience with an OR gate, and now we're making it four input OR gate, we know A, B, and C, and we know X. What's D look like? Okay, and again, we're going to make use of those don't care situations. In this region here, x is clearly a zero. All the other logical values are zero, a, b, and c. If there was a one in the d position, we would definitely know the output x would be zero, it would be one, but it's a zero. So that means d has got to be a zero at that point. That's definitely known. But at this point from one to two, what value could d have? It could have a one and our output would be one. It could have a zero, and our output could be one. Regardless, okay, it's a don't care situation. And it's pretty much gonna be don't care for quite some time. I'm gonna go ahead and it doesn't care, doesn't care, doesn't care up to this point. And I'm gonna go ahead and leave, purposely leave this blank. And now I'm gonna stop this recording and ask you to finish what you think D 
D may look like. And your estimate of it should look very similar to the estimate of what I'm about to write here. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording and put my estimate. And that right there is my best guess of what it would look like, of what D should look like. From here to here, it's clearly a zero because all the others are zero and our output is zero. Everybody else is a zero, but it's got a one output here. So who's the only data stream that could be producing the one? D. It's got to be there. Same thing here, where it's got three zeros, A, B, and C. D's got to be zero because our output is zero. And finally, it's don't care for the rest on. These things are, again, a great troubleshooting opportunities for you to uh, think about how these gates behave. Okay, and let's talk about troubleshooting. Let's say you have D. It's supposed to have data on it, but you accidentally hook it to ground. What would the output look like? Well, very similar to what we've discussed previously, where A or zero, it's almost like A plus zero, it's A. What if you do this? A or B or C or zero? It's only making the decision based off of A or B or C. Okay, so our output would look something like this. Regardless of what's really you think is being sent to D, what's really being received is a zero. Let's ask this question. What would happen if you accidentally shorted D to a high? Tricky, tricky. What would happen here? Do your best guess. And the answer is the output is high when any input is high. X takes a solid high logical value. So this is something you probably want to avoid. Basically, the gate's not doing anything right now. Let's talk about unused inputs. What would I want to do with that D input if I only wanted a three input OR gate? I have to do something with it. I have to either tie it to a zero or tie it to a one or do something else with it, something creative. What would you think I would be doing? Would I tie it to a one? Probably not because it's making the output always one. Again, what if I, let's go back to our previous one. What if I tied D to zero, an unused input? What am I making my decision off of? A or B or C? A or B or C? I'm not, D is not even influenced there. So you go have to, you do have to take into account those unused inputs if you're trying to take a larger gate and use it as a smaller gate, which you can. We've kind of really reached the end of this expanded inputs. And what I went over was the three input AND and a four input OR. And maybe try to do a four input AND and a three input OR just to make sure you're tracking. If you understood these two, yeah, you probably understand these. But if you need some help, yeah, I would recommend maybe hitting those again. Well, let's go into multi-level logic circuits. This is going to be super fun. So multi-level logic circuits are really where the fun kind of begins with digital electronics. Like I said previously, the AND, OR, and NOT, those are the three basic logic gates that in and of themselves are not particularly impressive. However, taken in combination, they can do greater and greater things. And that's exactly what we're going to do with the multi-level logic circuit. We're going to start combining these basic building blocks into more and more complicated configurations and do more and more impressive stuff with it. And the best way, honestly, to teach multi-level circuits, multi-level logic circuits, is just do a bunch of examples of these things. And I know some of the tricks that I'm going to be teaching you guys are, may seem simple and stupid and slow. Believe me, if you stay organized using the method I'm going to show you guys, it's going to be a lot easier when you get to more complicated circuits. First and foremost, we have been dealing with inputs and an output. A multi-level logic circuit is where the output of one stage is the input of the next. And the example that I'm going to use is just this guy, and an AND gate, A and B, no problem thus far, being fed into a NOT gate, an inverter. And there's my output X. OK, what I want you to do is develop a truth table for it, develop the timing diagram for it, and I want you to create the expression how you want to write it, and I want you to do that in VHDL. So I'm going to go ahead and list off these tasks. So there's the four tasks that we want to knock out. And before you do this, this is my advice. Don't go from the beginning to the end without stopping somewhere in between. And I know you can do this one. I know this one's easy for you. But check this out. This makes difference. Here's a signal right here. What is that signal? Just call it something. Call it M. What is the signal? M. M is equal to 
a and b. What is x? x is not m or not m. So what you can do is you're giving yourself, you're setting these things up in stages. So you can develop your truth table like this, a, b, m, x. And sometimes it actually helps to write the expression for m, whatever m might be, whatever that intermediary value might be, a and b, m. And what is x? x is equal to not m. You don't have to do all those steps, but again, this is what I'm saying this is this makes it a little bit easier. If b is 0, 1, 0, 1, and a is 0, 0, 1, 1, have I exhausted all possible combinations of the truth table? Yes, I have. Okay, what is m? Signal m is a and b. 0, 0, 0, 1. What is x? x is not m. Just invert m. 1, 1, 1, 0. And I know, and I know, some of y'all could just say, oh, this is easy. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. I know some of y'all can do that. And I'm super impressed. Start this way, it's going to become a little bit more complicated. Let's talk about the timing diagram. What would the timing diagram look like? Notice I haven't just said x. Okay, if that's b and that's a, I've got an extra space in the timing diagram there. You're authorized to do this. What does m look like? Well, m looks like an AND gate timing diagram where its output is high when all its inputs are high. Makes sense. What does output x look like? It's the inversion of m. So simply invert m. Stay within the lines here. That is my output for my timing diagram. Pretty simple. So we did the truth table with the timing diagram. What's the logical expression? We kind of already wrote it right here. What's m, a, and b? What's x? x is not m. So if x is equal to m, excuse me, not m, what is m? a and b. Whole thing negated. I cannot stress the importance of the whole thing negated. Notice I didn't stop my bar right here. I didn't stop my bar right there. I'm negating the whole thing. Alternately, to make sure that I'm definitely negating the whole thing, I can put parentheses around it, A and B, and negate the whole thing, or put a big old bar over it. I'm negating both operators and the sign. Okay, I'm negating the whole operation. What would that look like in VHDL? Well, think about our parentheses here that we just used. X is assigned the value of A and B negated, not A and B, and close it up. We're going to go back into this gate because this thing is incredibly useful. Not and. You know, I might be tempted to call it a not and gate, but because I'm super stressed for time and I don't have time for two syllable words, I might just call it a NAND gate. We'll come back and you will see this truth table over and over again. Don't worry about it now. We're multi-level logic circuits. Okay, let's go on to the next example of multi-level logic circuit. Okay, so what do you think about this one? A or B being inverted. What might the truth table, the time diagram, and the logical expression written and written as VHDL look like for this one? Use an intermediary term. I'm going to call this N, and let's say my output was Y. What is N? N is A or B. What does A or B look like? The output is high when any input is high. Low, high, high, high. What is Y? And I can write that expression in that column. What is Y? It's not N. What is N? Well, it's 0, 1, 1, 1. The inversion, 1, triple 0. So that's what my truth table looks like That for that. What's the timing diagram look like? N is A or B. What does Y look like? It's the inversion of N. Okay, you're authorized to do this. You're authorized to insert truth table, or excuse me, uh, timing diagrams off to the side. You can write them out and erase them. I don't care how you do these things. Just stay organized. Just having these intermediary values really, really, really helps out. What's the logical expression for this? Well, if Y is not N, and N is A or B, Stands the conjecture y is equal to, not n, n being 
A or B. So it's not A or B. I'm negating the whole thing. Just using parentheses to uh, emphasize that I'm doing the whole thing. I could also just say parentheses A or B, the bang, which means not, or a little hash, which means not. Sometimes you'll see the tilde. I don't like that one because it's Verilog. Okay, how would I write this in VHDL? The arch enemy of Verilog. Y is assigned A or B, parentheses, not. Not, parentheses, A or B, close parentheses, semicolon. What do you think this might be called? If I called the last gate an AND with an inverter a NOT AND or a NAND, I might be tempted to call this guy a NOR. You'll see this. Intimately familiar with this next week, or maybe even later this week. Okay, here's the next example of a multi-level logic circuit. And notice I've actually drawn three different types of multi-level logic circuits. They're all using AND gates. The first one right here on the left, We've got A anded with B. That result is then anded with C. Second one, we've got B and C anded together. And that result is then anded with A. Finally, last one, triple input AND gate, which you should remember. Are these guys all the same? And the answer is, is yes, they are, via what's called the associative property. And I like teaching the associative property via these multi-level logic circuits, because what you can do is verify. Don't take my word for these things, guys. You guys have the ability to go ahead and do these things, to check my work. And anytime I check somebody's work, I kind of pull up, pull up the BS flag of someone. If I see something that's, hey, I don't know about that, I'm going to check at my work. and I'm going to say, oh, hey, that thing's right or that thing's wrong. And if it's right, it kind of cements that feeling with me. So what I'm going to do is talk about the associative property. And what the associative property for AND gates is this. A and B and C. If I AND A and B together first, then AND that result with C, it's equivalent to ANDing A with the result of B and C. Does that make sense? which, by the way, is equivalent to A and B and C. Associative. It doesn't matter who it associates with first. Okay, so the associative property of AND gates. What I'm challenging you to do is I'm going to do one of these things here for you, is to see, is Jim telling me the truth? Is the associative property hold for all three of these things? So how are we going to do it? We're going to do it exactly the same thing that we did before. We're going to develop a truth table and a timing diagram. And finally, we'll some write some expressions, both in the written format and VHDL, just to make sure. So what's the truth table look like? Get three variables. I'm gonna do this one in the upper corner. There's an intermediary value right there. Let's pretend that is Z is our output. That's P right there. So I've cleaned it up a little bit, added a bare truth table. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say I've got my intermediary value P, my final value C, and I'll write this one as A, B, C. What is the expression P? The expression P is A and B. So I'm just going to again stay organized. All I'm doing is looking at these two columns. The output P is high when both or all of in P's inputs are high. One there and a one there. All the rest are zeros. Okay, what is the output Z? Z is expression is P anded with C. So again, I'm just staying organized. Now I just move over. All I'm doing is comparing P and it was C. Its output is high when all its inputs are high. Looks like right there and nowhere else. Does that look like a truth table for this guy? It certainly does to me. The output is high when all inputs are high. So that's what I'm showing you is the associative property of an AND gate. And what's really cool is I can make a three input AND gate out of two two-input AND gates. I can make a five-input AND gate out of a bunch of two-input AND gates. I'm just cascading them together. It doesn't matter which one, where you perform the operation first, as long as this, they're an AND gate. We're going to get into some different operations too, where order operations does make sense. We did the truth table. Let's do the timing diagram. Where does expression P 
and Z have their highs. It looks like P is high right here because it's A, B, and C. So P is taking a high value right here and right here because, again, we're only ending these two. And now what we're going to do is we're going to and C and P. What do we get as a result? Right there. Okay, very similar to the truth table, excuse me, the timing diagram we had for our three input AND gate. Finally, let's write our expression for that one on the left hand side. What is it? It is x is equal to a and b, parentheses, anded with c, because we are performing the a and b operation first, which is getting us p, and p is being anded with c. How do I write this in VHDL? x is assigned a and b in parentheses, and C, semicolon. And via the associative property, I can move those parentheses around to perform this operation or perform the whole operation at once. So let's go ahead over another example very similar to this one. Let's talk about the associative property for OR gates. I've pretty much got the exact same circuit up there. All I did was went ahead and flip-flop the ANDs with the ORs and got three different iterations. This first one is A or B, and its output is being ORed with C. Now the second one is, sorry about that. Okay, the second one is B or C, and its output, which I'm gonna call Q, is ORed with A. Finally, this last one, everybody's being ORed together. Are they equivalent? And my rush to the answer is yes, they are equivalent. That's what that three equal, three level equal sign means via the associative property of OR gates. And what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and try to prove that. This time, we're going to go ahead and use this one, the middle one, as the example. Truth table. Use that intermediary value I gave you, Q. Our final one is W. What is the expression for Q? It's B or C. What is the expression for W? W has two inputs, A or Q. What's Q? B or C? A or B or C? You can already kind of see it's equal. Let's go ahead and confirm that with Q. In our truth table, Q is B or C. So anytime there's a high in, it comes for B or C. There's a high in our output. There's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. We have just come up with the expression Q which is our intermediary value. And again, you don't have to use them. I'm recommending you to do. What is W? It's A or Q. Anytime Q or A have a high. Right now, no. And again, what columns am I looking at? These two columns. No. Next one is yes, 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 yes. There is my truth table. Do these results here look like a three input AND gate? They certainly do. If you do the same thing for this one on the left, you'll find that they have an equivalent truth table. And that's what it's illustrating is the associative property. If I'm going to write the expressions for these things, I could say A or B, the result of that, ORD with C, is equivalent to A ORD, or the result of B or C. And I could also write A or B or C. They're all equivalent via the associative property of OR gates. Last but not least, let's go ahead and do our timing diagram. Notice how I put the intermediary value Q in the final result W. Go ahead and see if you can fill this out. Hopefully, it's going to look like this. There you go, where Q is kind of performing this of the truth table, except I'm just putting on the timing diagram, and same thing for W. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to another example of a multi-level logic circuit. Okay, so here is the fifth example. And I'm actually going to start writing that down, example five, so you keep track of this. Okay, example five is going to illustrate a bunch of cool things for us. Uh, previously, we were talking about associative properties. Now let's start talking about order of operation. Sometimes the order of operations is critical. For example, in math, if I was to say to you, perform the following operation, two times three plus five, without any inflection in my voice, what's your answers? There's two different interpretations of this. And that's why you write them out. So 2 times 3 plus 5. One might assume 2 times 3, parentheses, plus 5. Or one might assume 2 times 3 plus 5. 
it's going to give you two totally different answers. Because 6 plus 5 is 11, and 2 times 8 is 16. Last time I checked, is 11 is not equal to 16. The deal is, is there's an order of operations. There's an order of precedence where multiplication takes precedence over addition in parenthesized equation. If you're not using parentheses, multiplication takes precedence over addition. Same thing with Boolean multiplication and versus Boolean ors. However, I can use those parentheses to force operations outside of the precedence. For example, this guy right there. I'm perform the addition before you do the multiplication. So what I'm saying is I used to say this in two things. I said use parentheses, part one, part two, use them correctly. Here's, here's what I'm saying is just use parentheses correctly, all simultaneously. This first one, this expression here is going to try to illustrate this order of operations. And I'm going to try to show you guys a bit about the commutative property. Notice how I've got my truth table. We've got two truth tables. Just trying to show you again, the truth table that we generate should still have valid data regardless of the order of the truth table. Commutative property deals with just a single game. For the expression, all I'm trying to do is just to illustrate the fact that you can order the truth table differently, you should get the same results. I'm using the intermediate value f, final value v, f, v. What is f? It's a and b. So what does the truth table for f look like? There, there. A little different on the other truth table, right? because a and b are in the far left column. Where is f1? Right there and right there. Notice they are two occurrences. There are only two occurrences there in that truth table, namely there and there, and two, two occurrences in that truth table. So if you're doing everything correctly, you should have the same amount of values same amount of ones, and they should be in the same place, which is what I'm gonna to try to illustrate here. Okay, all the rest are zeros. Okay, what's V? What, the, what is the expression V? F is A and B. What is V? V is F or C. So for this truth table, I'm looking at F or C. So what I see is one, 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 one there, one there, zero, zero, zero. This truth table, I'm looking at F or C. One, 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 one. How many times are there ones? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, I know I'm doing the table correctly or starting it off correctly. For what values? Well, when A is a 1, B is a 1, and C is a 1. Is that the same case for this other truth table? Yep, when A is a 1, B is a 1, and C is a 1. The second occurrence is when A is a 0, B is a 1, C is a 1. Is that the case over here? Yes, it is. A is 0, B 1, C 1, 1 0 1, 1 0 1. Zero, zero, one. There you go. Finally, one, one, zero. There you go. They're the same truth table for the same expression. I know they look different for the results. It's the addresses that are switched. But if you go address by address, you're going to get a one where it's supposed to be and a zero where it's supposed to be. All I'm trying to do is illustrate the fact that if you do a, B, C, or C, B, A, you should get, still get the same results, just in case you run across something like this. Let's talk about what we got going on here. We've got our truth table, excuse me, timing diagram. F, what is F? F is A and B. What's F look like? Well, it's A and B, so that's going to be high right there, and again, high right there. What is V? It's F or C. Makes sense. It's almost like I took this truth table, gave it a 90 degree turn, just laid it down and drew it out. How would I write this expression? I would say V is equal to F or C. What's F? A and it would be or C. I know multiplication takes precedence over addition, but I can make sure of that and make sure it's very clear by doing a parenthesis. It's not necessary to do that. I would recommend it.
Okay, in VHDL, how would I write this? Value V is assigned A and B or C. Close it. Again, take the necessary precaution, putting parentheses, it's easier to read. A and B, or with C. All right, let's do one more example. Let's do example six. Okay, so here's example six. All I really kind of did was uh, flip-flop the ands and or gates, and now the bottom two, B or C, are being ORed first, and they are in turn being anded with A. What does this expression look like? Use that intermediary value G. G to me looks like it's B or C. So I'm going to write that down. G is equal to B or C. I'm going to use my truth table. So B or C looks like 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. What is U? U is A ended with G. Use these two columns and them together. What do I get? 1, 1, 1. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, now go ahead and put this in a timing diagram. What does G look like? G is taking the value of B or C. B's got it. C's got it. B or C has it. Now, what is U? It's the AND of A and G. Where do I get times where they're both high? Right here, right here, and right there. What does the expression for this look like? So what I'm going to have here is the written expression is u is equal to g ended with a. What's g? It's b or c ended with a. Can I leave it like that? The answer is, is no, you cannot leave it like that because I just told you guys about the order operations. you got to do that parentheses there because the other way around doesn't work. To illustrate, it does not equal B or C and A because according to the order of operations, what you're getting is A and C or B. So you those, use those parentheses and use them correctly. Um, example six is pretty cool because it leads us up to our third property. So we talked about the commutative, we talked about the associative. Let's talk about the distributive. Think about in the bad old days of fourth grade learning math, think of just this, just six times three plus one. You can distribute that six into this. I don't know why you want to, but what is 6 times 3? It's 18. 6 times 1, 6. Okay, you get the answer 24, which is the same thing as 6 times 4. So that's what's known as a distributive property. We can do the same thing here. Our expression that we came up with for this multi-level logic circuit is B or C, parentheses, and it with A. I should be able to, via the distributive property, distribute this A into both of these and come up with A and B or C and A. And I can also just do it that way. You know, because of the commutative property, I can flip flop those things around. That's the distributive property. Okay, so what we're going to do is in example seven. Let's go ahead and see this. Does the distributive property hold true? Does A and B ORed with A and C, will it give us the same truth table here? So I'm going to go ahead and redo the time in a diagram and redo the truth table. And I'll put kind of original and new, and we'll see if, that's, if that makes sense. OK, so here we are. We're all set up for example seven. And this is kind of the question, the great question that we're trying to ask right here. Does our original expression, B or C, and it with A, via the distributive property, is it equal to A and B, or with A and C? And what I've done is down here in pink, I've drawn our original expression. And notice here what I've done is I've messed up our timing diagram a little bit here too. 
I've added two separate intermediaries. And I've got two intermediary columns here, and I've got our final expression here. Okay, notice I have not drawn the circuit yet either. Thus far in every single example, I've given you the circuit. What I want you to do is draw the circuit now, then do the truth table, the time diagram, right? And obviously we've already written the expression. So what I've done is I've given you this now, and you've got to go backwards. This is a little bit of an art form. Think about this as, again, it's going from left to right, and think about that order of, the oper order of operations. So multiplication has precedence over addition. So obviously addition is coming later. A and B, that's probably what I'd put in first, A and B, where is that output going to? Well, it's going to an OR gate. What's the other input to the OR gate? What's well, A and C? Okay, does that make sense? So what I can do is I can do an intermediary value right there. I'm going to call that P, intermediary value they are called Q. What is being fed into that OR gate? It's P or Q. I'm going to call that output X. So P, Q, output X. P, Q, output X. What is P? Well, it's A and B. What's Q? A and C. What's X? It's P or Q. So the ability also to take an expression and write a circuit, extremely, extremely important. Okay, because that's ultimately what you're going to be doing. You're going to be building these circuits. You're going to come up with a desired logic function based upon the description of what the circuit is supposed to perform, and you design it. So let's go ahead and see if, we, if this works. What is P? P is A and B. Right there, right there. What's Q? It's A and C. So the only time it's high is right there and right there. What does X look like? It's P or Q. P is high, Q is high, P and Q are high. Does our result that we obtained match this? It does. It's thereby proving the distributive property. I can write it either way. I can write this expression as B or C parentheses and it with A, or I can write it as A and B or A and C, which uses less gates. Okay, now here's here's a problem is think about the the implementation of this. One AND gate, two AND gate, one OR gate, or a total of three gates for this rendition. What's this one? It's one OR gate with B and C, and finally one AND gate. So two gates total, as opposed to three gates. I mean, think about this. I, I know I've been very uh, blunt about what's inside these things. There's transistors in there. They draw current. Uh, the draw of current is the consumption of power. If you've got two gates drawing power, which do you think is the more efficient, one with two gates or one with three gates? Quite obviously, the one with two gates. Depends on what the gates are. So sometimes you have to think about that, too, is how efficiently is this circuit designed? And I know I just talked about efficiency, but the most common way of writing an expression for these multi-level logic circuits, which you'll find out a little bit later on, is what's known as the sum of products, S-O-P expression. We'll go over this again. I'm going to kind of talk about it now, getting you prepped for it. What is an SOP? It's the sum of products. What's the sum? It's an or. What's a product? It's an and. It's an or of ands. Here's an and. Here's an and. I'm oring them together. Okay, that's an SOP expression. I know I just talked about this one being more efficient because it only uses two gates, and this one uses three gates. Logical expressions are more commonly expressed as SOP because you can buy an SOP implementation off the shelf with what's known as a PAL or a PLA. These are simple, or excuse me, SPLDs, simple programmable logic devices. Don't worry about what the acronyms mean right now. What they are is they're a programmable device with a bunch of ands that you can program that lead into an OR.
Uh, I'll show you what an SOP looks like, for example, eight, and then I'll actually show you how to implement this in a, in a SPLD. Okay, so this is an example of an SOP expression, sum of products expression. Here is product term one, product term two, and they are being ORed together with this final OR. What is the product term there and there? This to me looks like it is ending A with, uh oh, we've got another gate preceding it. So if it's B on this side, what's here? It's not B. So A ended with not B. Notice how I've stopped the line, the negation line, only above B. I'm not negating that whole operator. I'm not saying that. That's, the wrong, that's wrong. That is the correct implementation of it. What's this other one here? It's C ended with D. What is this final expression? It is A ended with not B, ORed with C and D. A sum of products expression. ANDs being ORed together. If you want to, let's go ahead and do a quick truth table on this guy. So again, use those intermediary values. I'm just going to call this one P, that one Q. Is that the best way of organizing it? You know what I'm going to even do? I'm going to throw an extra one here. Not B, P, Q. Throw an entire extra one for the final answer. Again, I'm using those intermediary values to help me stay organized. If B is a 0, 0, 1, 1, what is not B? It's 1, 1, 0, 0. Finally, what is P? P is A ANDED with not B. There, 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 and there. You should be able to do this by yourself, by the way. OK, Q, try Q. It's C ANDED with D. Finally, what is our final expression? It is P or Q. Let's call that Z as our output. Z, 1, 1. So hopefully you came up with the same values for that. And lo and behold, we've got this output over here, which is not taking the form of an AND or an OR or a simple inverter. It's taking this pretty weird output where it's 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, quadruple 1. So it's pretty neat. We've taken some basic gates, two ANDs, a single NOT, and a single OR, and created a very bizarre function and let's just say this function does something exactly the way we want it to and kind of the, the point of this thing is just to illustrate what an SOP is because the SOP is very commonly associated with programmable logic devices and just as a quick compare and contrast just think how you would implement this thing using the 7400 series of chips so I'm gonna draw a couple boxes here real quick Okay, I got 17404, which is our hex inverter, uh, 17408, which is our quad 2 input AND gate, and 17432, which is our quad 2 input OR gate. Every single one of them, plus 5 volts. Every single one of them, ground. Where does A go? Signal A, and I know I'm crossing over the top of chips, which is not a good, goes in the into input to one AND gate. Where does B go? Well, it goes into one input of an inverter out and goes back to that other AND gates input. I know I'm not being clear in which the pin numbers are. What I'm saying is there's NOT gates in there, AND gates in there, OR gates in there. Where does C go? Well, C goes into another AND gates input. Where does D go? Another AND gates input. The first AND gates output goes to the input of an OR, the second AND gates output, the input of an OR. Finally, our final output is right there. And that's a simple circuit, guys. You got three chips, like a dozen wires, all those plus fives, all those grounds, all those interconnections in between. It's easy to get messed up. What if I was to tell you guys, you don't need to wire things up? And that's exactly what a PLD does. So this is a brief intro to how uh, PLDs are organized. And we're going to stick with this SOP. There is something called a POS, which is a product of sums. So if an SOP is ORing a bunch of ANDs, a POS is 
ending a bunch of ors, but we're going to try to stick with a SOP right now. Okay, let me draw something here for you. So what if I was to say to you that something like this was commercially available? And just look at the circuit. I know there's a little bit more inputs to it. You've got your A, not A's, B's, not B's, so on and so forth. And it's already wired for you. Does that look a lot better than doing something like this? It certainly does to me. The other advantage about this thing is, is I can program this thing on the right to perform this function today. And then when I don't want that function, I can reprogram it to perform some other function. Okay, it's a reprogrammable, programmable logic device. And this is what's known as a PAL array. Okay, it's a programmable AND array, sometimes also called a PLA, which is a programmable AND and a programmable OR. For our particular purposes, let's just call it a PAL. That's a simple programmable logic device. What it is, it's programmable ANDs that feed a fixed OR. What does it create? it creates an SOP expression. And believe it or not, any combinational logic expression can be expressed as an SOP, as we'll see later, regardless of how many crazy gates you want to put in it. Okay, so how does this thing work? Just how does this diagram work? First off, this is what's known as one-line notation. It would be confusing if every single, like this particular example, I've only got two AND puts, one and two, or one, two AND gates. It'd be confusing if I had those two AND gates with eight inputs each. I might have to draw eight inputs for the first one, eight put inputs for the second one. What if I had a third AND gate, a fourth AND gate, fifth gate, AND gate? It would get crazy. So this is what's known as one line notation. It's substantially simpler and easier to read than all those crazy wires. First off, you got one AND gate here. And let's say it's limited to slash eight connections. What that means is this line here actually is eight lines crossing these other things. It's almost like a highway. What is the overpass? What's well, these input lines? What are the input lines? What's well, the complement and the original of the inputs? A, B, C, and D. And it's complements, not A, not B, not C, and not D. How are these generated? Well, it's non-inverting and inverting buffer, and I, that's supposed to be a triangle, it kind of looks like this, where A is coming in, A is coming out that side, it's because it's got a bubble there, not A is coming out there. And I'm not going to draw that over every single one of those four inputs there, because basically what's going to happen is you've got that inverting and non-inverting buffer there. You've got four input pins, A, B, C, and D. But internally, it can generate its regular non-complement version and its complement, its inversion. This is a really cool device. You've got all the NOT gates, all the AND gates, and all the OR gates. All you gotta do is connect them. Okay, how you connect things in one line notation is you put an X on it if it's connected, and don't do nothing if it's not. So our first AND gate, let's use our same example. First AND gate, it's A AND with NOT B. X, X. What is that first AND gate's product term? A AND with NOT B. You do the second one, and you should come up with C and D. C and D. Finally, what is our output expression? A and it with not B, or with C and D. That is a lot easier to read and to implement than all this mess over here. And like I said, is you can reprogram this device the next day. And we're going to learn how to go ahead and do this using a number of different methods. There's this thing called schematic capture, or there's this thing called VHDL. VHDL is kind of the preferred method of doing it. There's also another language which called Verilog, but it's a hardware definition language. That's what the VHDL, hardware definition language. What's the V stand for? Very high speed integrated circuit, hardware definition language, acronym within an acronym. What you do is you use this programming language to create hardware on a programmable logic device. A particular vendor has a software program that basically converts your VHDL into something that connects or disconnects those fuses. Okay, that's what's known as a fuse or an antifuse. Okay, an antifuse. Let me zoom in on this guy. Here's an overpass, here's an underpass. And if you could imagine there is a link 
between them. And either you break that connection or you make that connection, depending upon whether you want to fuse it or anti-fuse it. When there's an X there, it is connected. When it's not connected, it is not connected. Let's just do a simple example of using this kind of the super primitive, and by the way, this is very primitive PAL SOP one line notation. Let's go ahead and do another example of using just this notation on the right. Okay, so here's another PAL set up to implement an SOP and just go ahead and take it one step at a time and figure out where you could potentially save yourself some work and uh, give yourself kind of like these intermediary stages. All right, my choice is just to go AND gate by AND gate. I'm going to do is look at that first one. What is that first one's expression? Looks like it's hooked up to an A, ANDed with a B, ANDed with a NOT C. The second AND gate looks like it's got NOT B, and it's ANDed with D. And what happens to those guys? They are ORed together. It's a sum of two product terms, an SOP expression, all implemented with this programmable logic device, which I can program to implement this, erase it, do something else the next day. What does a truth table look like? Go ahead and use this truth table, and I would suggest is potentially using these columns here for those intermediary values. Ideally, your truth table, once you've done, you should look something like this. And that's for the first AND gate. And notice how, too, I also made myself that NOT C column to just help myself out. Let's go ahead and do that for the second AND gate. And ideally, if you do everything correctly, you should look something like this. And that is implementing NOT B and NOT B and D in two separate columns. Finally, what is our OR gate? It's the synthesis of column one and two in an OR gate. I'm going to take the right one. It's this expression or with that expression. And you should get a truth table that looks like this. And let's just say that that is output Z. So I'm not going to be able to fit that whole expression in the box. Okay, you should get triple zero, one, quadruple zero, one, one, zero, one, double zero, excuse me, double one, double zero, all the way down. It's an SOP implemented on a programmable logic device. This PAL structure, where it's a bunch of ands feeding a fixed or, is kind of how a CPLD works. Okay, let's go ahead, uh, take a little break from some of the stuff we're doing here and just talk about programmable logic. Okay, so if that PAL structure is inside that box and you take a bunch of these PALs and stick them on a chip, that's kind of what a CPLD is. There's a bunch of more complicated stuff on there too. There's an interconnection, which is kind of controlling how everybody talks to each other. And additionally, these PALs can talk to each other. Additionally, there's input-output logic for each one of these things. And don't worry so much about all the other boxes right there, because they all are kind of just mumbo-jumbo right now to you. But that's what a CPLD is. It really is. It's kind of like a bunch of these little blocks that you can hook up in a different fashion one day, and then a the next fashion the next day, and create some pretty complicated logic. Now, an FPGA is kind of taking it one step further, and it's doing the same thing, but it's doing it in a different manner. If you could imagine a PAL really is performing the logic. Obviously, it's an AND gate with A and B and not C, feeding an OR gate, which also happens to have not B and D on its other input. It really is that logic being implemented. An FPGA, it's kind of a trick. An FPGA, which is what we're going to be using a little bit uh, later on, is taking this truth table and putting it in memory. You don't really implement the logic with an FPGA. You kind of put that stuff in memory. In what's called a lookup table. Lookup table, L-U-T. And it's got kind of this symbol here. It looks like a multiplexer because it kind of is. It's a, it's a data selector. And this data selector for this four variable truth table, it can select one of 16 positions, 0 through 15. And basically what you're telling it on your inputs A, B, C, and D, you're just telling it the address. When you have a1, B1, C0, D1, that address gets spit out. It spits out a 1 for you. 
okay? You dig what's going on there? It's not really implementing the logic, as in if it's an and and an or, it's just putting that stuff in memory. This is just something for you in the future right now. Don't worry about necessarily how these things are implementing it so much right now. Just be aware that there is slight differences between a CPLD, which is really kind of a collection of SPLDs. They're slightly different because uh, FPGA is using memory, a lookup table to generate this, to generate the same output as if this logic here was doing it. You're getting the same results, just in a different method. We have gone over a bunch of information on expanded inputs and multi-level logic gates. Went over the commutative property. And again, what is the commutative property? A and B, it's equivalent to B and A. What's the associative property? For AND gates, it's A and B. It's equivalent to A and B and C. Same thing for OR gates. It doesn't matter who you go first. Finally, we went over the distributive, that was the associative. Went over the distributive property. We can distribute very similar to what we did in math. And we are going to go over these again. Don't worry about this. So that's commutative, associative, distributive. We went over order of operations. Be aware that multiplication occurs before addition. Make sure you're doing it correctly by putting the parentheses in where they need to be. We went over this uh, sum of products format. We went over basic uh, understanding of how PLDs work and the one line notation. And I think kind of the sum of this thing is just with these multi-level gates, you have my permission to use intermediary values. Use the intermediary values, for an example like this, use those intermediary values to help you guys set up this truth table. But now we're gonna go on another gun over this. Uh, we're gonna go into some other gates. So we've talked about the ands, ors, and nots. There are other gates out there which are extremely useful. And they're actually made out of ands, ors, and nots, but they're worth discussion upon themselves.